Welcome back. We're talking about the economic problems in Greece. Joining us from Athens is journalist Nick Malkoutsis. With us from Brussels is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, Sebastien Doulin. And joining us from London is economist and author Philippe Legrain. Thanks to all of you again. Nick, the economic impact uh, that Greece is facing is enormous, as we all know. As you yourself have pointed out, unemployment is rising above 27%. GDP has contracted by a quarter. And, of course, the country owes money. How is this affecting ordinary Greeks who seem to have been forgotten in this debate to some extent? Well, they have, yes. And it's often the case that people come here and they look around and they don't see the signs of the crisis. But, of course, this is a type of crisis that we, in Europe at least, we really haven't experienced before. A developed European economy losing a quarter of its GDP within a few years, unemployment shooting up at one, at one stage close to... 28% uh, and uh, at the same time having to shrink a, a, a deficit of over 15%. I mean, this simply hasn't have it happened again, so we don't really have the reference points when we're looking for it. But if you scratch beneath the surface, there are serious problems. And if you look at one, for instance, unemployment, uh, 80, around 80% 80 of the, the, the Greek people who are unemployed receive no benefits at all. They're completely left to their own devices. We also have problems in terms of uh, rising poverty levels. We have a very high risk uh, level of uh, households at risk of poverty. Uh, the health system is uh, suffering. So there are lots of signs. Once you start scratching beneath the surface, Greece is still a developed uh, European country with a functioning economy. But once you start looking behind the scenes, uh, this is very much a crisis that's playing out in people's homes, in people's workplaces, in hospitals, in schools, and so on. And that's where you can really see that there is a crisis. Right, Philippe, I want to refer to something that you have written, and I'm quoting you here. It's, you've written that it's a tragedy that Greece's corrupt elites have collaborated with Eurozone policymakers at the expense of ordinary Greeks to suffer unnecessarily hard, uh, hardships. Uh, you know, Nick just told us about some of those hardships, but, you know, the, the thing about the corrupt elites collaborating with Eurozone policymakers. Uh, explain that to us. Well, I mean, the, the, the fact is, is that the, the bailout of uh, Greece in 2010 uh, was primarily uh, a bailout of Greece's foreign creditors, uh, notably uh, German and French banks. Uh, and because of the refusal to write down Greece's debts, uh, absolutely brutal austerity has been imposed uh, on uh, Greece. Now, the myth is that this has been accompanied by wholesale reforms uh, to make the economy function better. Uh, the reality is that the corrupt elites who have mismanaged uh, the economy uh, for decades have managed to protect um, uh, their friends and allies uh, so that while ordinary Greeks have suffered terrible suffering, um, uh, the rich still don't pay taxes uh, and politically connected companies still enjoy uh, quasi-monopolies uh, in lucrative markets. So it's been, uh, it's been terrible for ordinary Greeks. Uh, it's a racket that has paid off foreign banks. Uh, and Greek elites uh, have, have got off more or less scot-free. Right, as uh, Nick has been pointing out to us. Sebastian, there is talk of Greece dropping out of the uh, Eurozone. Is that likely to happen? I mean, is there a possibility of that? Or is that just bluster? I mean, in principle, it's possible to drop out of the Eurozone. Um, in such a scenario, Greece would probably default on its debt. And as a next step, they would introduce a new currency to recapitalize their own banking system. Of course, there are some legal issues here relative to the European treaties and, uh, well, their, their obligations with their partners. But it doesn't mean it cannot be done. It has been done in the past with other countries leaving certain currency arrangements, and it can be done in the future. And in the end, political will and economic reality will trump the legal basis. Um, and it's imaginable that this, this could happen. Uh, it's not that someone wants it at the moment, but it might be an outcome of this crisis. Nick, what kind of uh, room does Syriza have to play hardball with the European institutions, the EU and the IMF? Well, they, they don't have a lot in the sense of Greece's finances are very tight. Uh, the, the bailout uh, the ends at the end of uh, February. There are questions about whether the European Central Bank will keep funding uh, Greece's banks. And without that liquidity, then Greece is in a very, very difficult uh, position. I think what they have on their side, and this ties in with the, the, the point you made with uh, Philippe earlier, is 
that uh, Syriza is coming to power for the first time in its history. Uh, it has this ability to go to the Europeans with a convincing plan to say that, look, a lot of the structural reforms you wanted done in the last few years weren't done because the political system didn't want to do them. We, we don't have those vices. We don't have those reservations. We want to do them, and we want to do you to help us uh, make these uh, advances in terms of fighting corruption, in terms of uh, greater transparency in the political system, in terms of improving the tax collection. But they have to bear in mind that the Europeans, the Troika, have heard these kinds of promises before. So they need a real convincing, detailed plan over the next uh, few weeks that will get the Europeans on their side and will form part of the basis of this consensus that we're looking for over the next few weeks. Philip, one of the ideas that's been put on the table by Syriza is that they will repay their debts, Greece's debts, according to Greece's growth. Is that something that's feasible? Are creditors going to buy that? Well, I think that you know, previous debt restructurings have involved uh, exchanging old bonds that pay um, uh, an interest rate uh, to, for ones that pay a return related uh, to a country's GDP growth. So there is a precedent for it. Uh, and I think that that could be um, part of the solution, uh, tying uh, Greece's uh, debt payments to its ability to pay. Sebastian, is there any uh, middle ground here, perhaps the European creditors extending uh, the bailout deadline? I mean, the point would be that uh, in order to bring down the debt burden over a long period of time, and that's what it, what's necessary now, you would have to prolong these loans to a very large extent. For example, you could say, well, these are now 50 or 100 year loans and they pay only a minimal interest rate. If you do that, that would be pretty similar to debt restructuring and it would help Greece. In principle, this could be a middle ground because then the German politicians would not have to face their own public saying, well, we have um, given money to Greece, we have written down the debt, but we have just extended the loans. Um, in fact, this is something which has been discussed in Berlin among the uh, policymakers and the ministry officials already in 2013 prior to the last German election. It was postponed at that point and then never implemented, but I think this is something you could sell to the German public. Nick, uh, there is support uh, on this side of the Atlantic for the Greek position. Let's take a listen to what President Obama said. You cannot keep on squeezing countries that are in the midst of depression. Uh, at some point, there has to be a growth strategy in order for them to pay off their debts to eliminate some of their deficits. So there's support from President Obama. That, that's, that must be welcomed in Greece. Well, I think it was certainly a, a, a boost to the, the new government uh, when he made those comments uh, yesterday, especially after the torrid first week they had in power. But we, we need to also put in, in perspective that it's not the first time uh, President Obama or the U.S. administration has spoken in this terms of uh, how the Eurozone is dealing with its crisis. They obviously disagree uh, broadly with the tactics being followed. And even in August 2013, when the previous Greek Prime Minister, uh, Adonis Samaras, went to Washington, uh, Obama said more or less the same thing. So he was a little bit, bit more uh, outspoken this time. But it, it reflects a view, certainly on, on, on that side of the Atlantic, and a growing view within Europe that uh, Greece is in a position where it really can't do a lot more. And I think this is a very difficult uh, concept to, to, to get across. Again, I go back to the example that this situation isn't really one we've experienced in Europe before. And it is in, incredibly different, di difficult in a, in a country whose economy is more or less collapsing. Uh, which is under uh, uh, severe uh, austerity measures, or has been until uh, now, to uh, enact convincing deep change. Because everyone is looking to protect what little they have. They're looking to hold on to whatever security they can. And it's very difficult to, to put through reforms in a climate like that. Philippe, when we look at the leverage that uh, Syriza may use, may have in Greece, I mean, one of the things they're talking about right now is that this huge trade pact that is being talked about between the United States and Europe, known as the uh, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Pact, Syriza is saying they could sink that. They will not approve that. And they know they have that power of veto in Europe. Is it likely to use that? Well, I mean, obviously, Syriza could play a variety of foreign policy cards. 
um, they could cozy up uh, to Russia uh, and oppose EU sanctions uh, on that country. Um, uh, they could try to tor torpedo uh, the negotiations with the United States, though there's enough opposition uh, to those negotiations uh, across Europe, not least in Germany, uh, that, that they don't need the Greek government uh, to do that. I think, actually, their position is stronger uh, than people think, because I don't think that um, uh, Germany wants to force uh, Greece out of the euro. It certainly doesn't want to be blamed uh, for potentially uh, torpedoing the European project by breaking up the euro. Uh, and it knows financially that it stands to lose everything uh, if Greece is forced out. So, yes, you know, there's all sorts of things that could go wrong. Um, yes, either side are going to say things um, which make it look like agreement is impossible, uh, but, but I think the, the, that uh, you can find uh, a middle ground. Uh, Sebastian pointed out uh, that one sort of room for agreement would be in terms of extending maturities and um, cutting interest rates. There is one problem with that, though, uh, which is that the rules of the EU fiscal compact require uh, governments which have debts in excess of 60% of GDP uh, to cut that excess by a 20th a year. So an exception would be need to, need to, to, make, to, be, need to be made for Greece uh, if, um, uh, if the nature of the debt write-down um, didn't involve a headline uh, haircut. Right, and Sebastian, what is your view on that? Um, you know, as Philippe pointed out, uh, Greece could oppose sanctions against Russia. It said that it opposes uh, the embargo that is in place right now. I mean, Greece is a member of NATO. Can it scuttle NATO plans, throw a spanner in the works? Well, I, I don't think it, it could actually torpedo NATO's plans because NATO is not anywhere where, where it now ha wants to do military action against Greece. Uh, NATO is a defense uh, project. But of course, it's, it's bad enough if Greece manages to torpedo the sanctions because as they are, as the uh, law is in the European Union, they are um, up for renewal will soon. And in addition, if you want to pass new uh, sanctions, you need a unanimous vote by the member states. And so if Greece says no, then the sanctions will expire and and uh, there will be no new sanctions. And this is, of course, uh, pretty pretty heavy leverage over uh, EU's ex um, external policy and foreign policy, especially since the Ukraine is the first big test of the new framework of uh, foreign policy uh, the EU is, is uh, trying to put together. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Uh, that's all we have time for. But the conversation, of course, continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV underscore America. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.